but it's clear from these results that investors are selling in big numbers in those in Victoria and in Queensland, and they're also the two states that have had the most punitive uh, rental policies over the same period of time. That's Nicola McDougall, who is the chair of the Property Investment Professionals of Australia. And there Nicola is talking about what they now know about property investors in Australia. Hello, I'm Kevin Turner and welcome to this week's Realty Talk Show. Pippa, an easier way of saying property investment professionals of Australia, have just conducted their ninth annual sentiment survey so as to check the health and the sentiment of the thousands of mum and dad investors who make up the vast majority of the property investment community. There is so much that's changed and the insights are quite revealing. So we're devoting the entire show this week to going over the most important points with Nicola. If this is your first time with us, welcome. You'll find us on all podcast players and through the Southern Cross Oz Serio Network. If you like the show, I certainly hope you do, hit the subscribe button and help us continue to bring you the best guests. We'll be back in just a moment as Bushy kicks off this week's show with Nicola McDougall. Successful property investment is a game of finance. Do you have the right team and the right game plan? Realty Talk is brought to you by Know How Property. More than mortgage brokers, Bushy Martin and his team of investment architects set you up with a sustainable strategy structured to lower your costs, tax, risk and stress while increasing your capacity for growth. Know How has helped over 1,900 homeowners and investors secure more than $800 million in property wealth. So get set to live more, work less, and live your legacy. Want to know how to invest in your freedom? Visit knowhowproperty.com.au. This is Realty Talk, powered by realty.com.au. Now, it's fair to say that the silent majority of mum and dad property investors like you and I have been under constant assault in recent times and wrongly painted as the greedy villains by the mainstream media, as well as the convenient donkey to pin the tail on by politicians, policymakers, and unfortunately, all levels of government. And we've been blamed for all of our housing woes. And they use this as an excuse to deflect blame for their decades of supply and neglect by introducing a continuous torrent of quite reactive and often half-baked draconian restrictions on the main suppliers of rental housing in Australia. So what effect is all this having and how are everyday investors feeling and thinking about property conditions both now and into the future? Well, to answer this, the results of the ninth annual Property Investor Sentiment Survey have just been released by peak industry body, the, profess the Property Investment Professionals of Australia, or PIPA. And this survey is Australia's most comprehensive snapshot of the nation's property investment community. So for a special Realty Talk feature, PIPA's chair, Nicola McDougall, joins us again to reveal the outcome. So welcome back to the Property Hub, Nicola. Thank you for having me, Bushy. It's always good to be here. Likewise, I uh, love talking property with you because you've got your finger right on the pulse of what's happening around the nation. And I guess, you know, on the tip of everyone's lips uh, and, and jumping straight into the survey outcomes, uh, what's the sort of headline message that's emerging from this year's survey? Yeah, this year's survey found that um, about 12% of investors um, had sold at least one of their properties in the 12 months to August this year. Uh, we had a record number of survey respondents this year as well. Uh, and um, drilling down into that, it was certainly investors selling off in great numbers in Victoria and Queensland over that period as well. Mm, I'm assuming that's going to be stripping uh, potentially uh, thousands of rental properties out of the market, is it? Oh, certainly like this is the second year. Well, I mean, obviously it's our ninth, uh, ninth annual uh, survey, uh, but it's the second year in a row where we've actually drilled down into sort of what investors have been doing with their properties, meaning selling and why they're selling and where they're selling. So last year we had, you know, around about, I think it was 16.7% of investors last year who said that they'd sold in the previous two years. Now I don't, now I'm sitting here a year later going, why did we ask in the previous two years? But anyway, so sit about that sold in the previous two years. So last year, we, you know, our analysis showed that that was probably a couple of hundred thousand properties that have been removed from the rental market. And we say removed because the majority of people that are buying these properties are not other investors. They are existing homeowners or, you know, first-time buyers. Um, and so therefore, if we look at the results again this year, 
they're kind of worse, I suppose, in that respect, because we just asked, what have you done in the last 12 months? And in the last 12 months, 12%, 12.1% said that they'd sold at least one property. Um, and when we're doing the analysis, we always actually use like the biggest data set we all have, which is the census data. But we actually also strip out any social housing that might be in any, any government housing in there. Um, yeah. so, it, so it gives you a baseline of around about 2.4 something million uh, rental properties in the nation. So, you know, if you sort of uh, what's twelve? What's twelve percent of two point four um, million? Um, that's another couple of hundred thousand properties. So you know we've estimated um, that over the last three years that we've been asking this question in the survey, it's highly likely that we've seen hundreds of thousands of rental properties just been stripped from markets around the nation. At a time when we yeah, can at least afford to do that, and you know, do, doing the maths on what you said there, uh, about two hundred, just under two hundred and twenty thousand dwellings potentially stripped out. And uh, 73% of survey respondents indicating that they've actually sold to homeowners rather mm. than investors, which is which is pretty scary. But uh, I'd love to sort of dig into what are some of the reasons investors are giving for selling or intending to sell uh, so many of their properties, Nicola? I think what was really interesting, and then, you know, obviously as our survey becomes um, more extensive, uh, but also, you know, rolls year to year to year, we're starting to get some really good metrics there. Um, and certainly now that we're actually asking investors, you know, what they're doing and why they're doing it, there was quite profound the difference to last year because last year the survey results, the number one reason why investors nationally said that they'd sold a property was to make the most of marketing market of rising market conditions. Yeah. Let's be honest, 2021, good year for all of us. Yeah. Um, and at, at the time last year, when we looked at the results and we went, okay, well that, you know, that would explain why people have done it, but certainly why a lot of people had sold in Queensland, because that was the number one state by a long way last year. Yeah. Uh, because as someone who owns a number of properties in Queensland, things hadn't been great before COVID, you know. Um, so that was so that was last year. Now the big difference with this year um was that the number one reason why investors um said that they was had sold in the previous 12 months was because of increasing or even the threat of increases of government uh, taxes and levies. Uh, the Victor the new Victorian land tax was um one reason what given for that. So that was the number one reason, which is quite different to last year. Uh, number two was actually changing tenancy legislation. Uh, so, you know, investors feeling that they've lost control of their asset, um, rental reforms increasing holding costs. Uh, when we're talking about something like that, it might be the implementation of the new rental cap here in Queensland that was um, implemented retrospectively and caught many investors, myself included, on the hop when our, at the same time as our mortgage repayments were going through the roof, but we were unable to even put our rent up. Um, so they were the top two. The, the top, the number three, which I probably thought this year might have been higher up the list, uh, was rising interest rates. Mm -hmm. um, it was like the top three were all sitting in that forty-something bracket. Um, but yeah, rising interest rates was the you know was a reason for forty percent of investors uh, for selling their property in the last twelve months. So you know those results are in stark contrast because we asked the same questions last year, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. we're not we're not. You know, we're asking similar things all the time and you can actually see the sentiment there, right? That, you know, this time last year, investors offloaded because they wanted to make the most of the rising market. I don't, can't even, I don't even know where the rising market was in the result. I think it was like quite low down because let's be honest, for half of the last 12 months, the market hasn't actually been that great. No. Um, so that's been, you know, really, you know, those metrics, because I'm a data nerd, those metrics are, are really quite profound. Um, and even having that one year comparison that we have now, really showing that shift in investor sentiment um, that's happened in, in just a one year period. Well, that, that sort of lack of control that you talk about due mm. to the government intervention, you know, with just under 50 percent uh, uh, doing it because of governments increasing the taxes and then 43 percent from my read on due to the changing legislation mm. Mm. Uh, and outranking uh, rising interest rates when the mainstream media, that's all they talk about. You would have expected that to be uh, top of mind, but the, the fact that it's not is, is pretty telling. And, and I think there's, uh, again, digging into the details, is just under 30 percent. Uh, because of the rental increase limits or caps that are, are being are talked about. So pretty scary numbers there uh, based on those punitive and quite restrictive uh, exercises, Nicola. Mm. Uh, sort of uh, moving from there then, did the survey results indicate uh, in a bit more detail who the properties were actually sold to? 
Yes, I mean, because we do ask that, you know, um, and um, I think it was around about 40% of, of properties were sold to existing home homeowners um, and around about 33% uh, sold to first home buyers. What was really interesting compared to last year um, was the fact that last year, um, the number of investors who bought those previous investment properties was around about the 33% mark. Uh, this year, though, it had dropped to about 24%. Um, so you can actually see see in action there the fact that this time last year, you know, investors were more active in the market than they had been during this period. Um, one argument that I often get with this bushy, um, and no doubt will be happening um, when I'm, you know, representing the industry at various uh, government forums, yeah. is people go, well, you know, isn't it good that first home buyers are, are buying these properties? And of course, we would say, hell yeah, we believe in property investment, um, you know, as a strategy to improve your financial future, your financial health. Um, so we say, hell yeah. However, then we often get the argument that, well, if a first time buyer bought it, well, then that means that their rental property is now available for another person, you know, and I'm, I'm and it's and look again. Sometimes it's the paucity of data that really makes it difficult to um, argue against some of these statements because we don't know, right? We don't know where those first time buyers have come from. Um, highly unlikely, one would think that most of them would be living in a rental property just by themselves or their partner. Probably more likely they're in a share house. Probably just as likely they're still living at home. Yeah. Um, so this is this is what you know. We kind of, as I said, I'm just kind of explaining that that I often get I get this pushback on that data, and um, and I, I don't know how we will ever overcome that, apart from the fact of understanding, um, hopefully, where those first home buyers, if they're saving a deposit, which as we know has always been difficult and continues to be difficult. Um, that often means, you know, that they probably have to live at home for a short period of time. I did that myself in 2006. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I could, this is 2006 and I bought my first property in uh, early 2007 and it was $350,000, which seemed extraordinarily expensive at the time. <laughs> but I went home to live with my mum yeah. for six months. Yeah, you know, and I was in my early thirties, you know. So um, anyway, I just thought I'd, I'd say that that um, you know we always support. It's great to see first home buyers buying, um, but then what we're actually seeing is it's almost like a game of homes where it's those existing homeowners, whether they're upgrading, um, downgrading, um, that sort of thing. Um, they they are the ones that are you know predominantly the number one uh, volume of people that are buying these investment properties, which means that they are removed from the rental market. Well, exactly. What what is what it's telling in really simple terms is that there's you know in excess of or nearly seventy five percent have, have gone to owner occupied mm. first home buyers, and there's, there's been a, a a almost a third drop in the number of properties that have been sold to investors. So it's clearly the big leakage uh, in in terms of again reducing that uh, uh, rental stock at a time when it's most needed. So uh, very interesting, uh, and, and again, I guess drawing a, a line around some of the commentary uh, that you've made on the on the survey uh, that sort of suggests that there's potentially about 265,000 uh, rental properties been removed uh, as a result of last year's survey. Mm, so mm. if you put them together, that's a, that's a, a massive exodus that, that's happening from... And I think, yeah, 100%. And I, I think, that, you know, those numbers can seem um, quite, quite ridiculous in a way, or, you know, it's certainly scary, but... Um, everyone's trying to understand why we're in this rental crisis and no doubt we'll talk a bit more about it on the show but this has to be certainly one of the reasons yeah, you know there are a number of factors we didn't get here overnight it won't be fixed overnight no. um but there are a number of factors that are happening concurrently and this uh, is certainly one of them so from those comments about just how many investors are selling up in some of the states for various reasons the question is how many say they will come back and buy another property somewhere else, or will they in fact seek another form of investment? Bushy and Nicola discuss that when we return. This is Realty Talk, back in just a moment. Property deductions can save you thousands of dollars each year. To make sure you maximise deductions, you need to work with the most experienced quantity surveyor in the country. BMT Tax Depreciation is the leading specialist in the industry. They've completed over 700,000 tax deduction schedules for residential investment and commercial properties Australia-wide. BMT guarantee to find double your fee in the first full financial year deductions. 
Call BMT on 1300 728 726 today for an obligation free quote. Realty Talk and your host, Bushy Martin. Now, I guess uh, of, of big interest, really, uh, of, of those who have sold a property, mm. I'd be interested in your thoughts around what proportion have indicated that they'll no longer invest in property. Any that was a, a, a fair, oh, you caught me on the hop there, Bushy. I don't know what that number is. <laughs> is it around about 12%? Yeah, it's about just under 13%. Oh, good. I'm glad because obviously there's so much data in the in the, in the the survey that I've, I know I know much of it, but not all of it. And I and that was a new question actually that we asked this year. Um, so we haven't got a comparison to last year, but we thought it was important to understand that. You know, if you've sold a property, are you ever got an investment property? Are you ever going to buy one ever again? And nearly thirteen percent have said, "Well, no." Yeah. You know, and that and that flows into as we were chatting before the show, the the, the you know the vast reduction in the normal uh, inflow of investors um, that's happened uh, since twenty fifteen. And it's and clearly, look, you know, as we get more data on this, um, we'll not, we'll have a better understanding of it. But um, that's part of the problem as well. We haven't had those normal inflows of investors adding to stock that we normally would, um, you know, prior to 2015. Exactly. And if the perception uh, out there is it's just too hard to invest in property when uh, mum and dad investors like you and I are doing the heavy lifting in mm. that space and will continue to do in reality, despite, you know, the, the recent uh, government initiatives, we'll, we'll still be carrying majority of the load so pretty interesting on that front and uh, now something I, I wouldn't mind giving a bit of a feel from is uh, any major differences in the uh, percentage of properties being sold between and across the states and territories do you know what was interesting this year um and again you know we do uh the, the survey does adapt and evolve so last year we just we, we, we kind of just asked them you know for the state that they sold in whereas this year we actually drilled down into whether it was a capital city or, or regional area um so in, 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 you know in regards to the state-based results you know compared to last year queensland um, was still number one um just under just just a smidge under 40 percent of investors sold that said that they'd sold at least one investment property in the previous 12 months um and then we had victoria as well i think that was in the early 30% mark and quite a big quite a big um, sort of gap between Victoria and, and Queensland over here and then it dropped down I think New South Wales was number three um uh, uh, but what's interesting you know and you'd think well New South Wales it's our biggest state um has the most people you would think that you know if we're talking about you know how what's the volume of investment properties that are normally sold well we're creating a data set to understand that as we speak um but you would think that just because of population and things that New South Wales would be, you know, higher up the list. But it's clear from these results that investors are selling in big numbers in those in Victoria and in Queensland. And they're also the two states that have had the most punitive uh, rental policies over the same period of time. Bearing in mind that this time last year, Bush year, when we were talking, um, we still had the Queensland interstate land tax, uh, um, which was what had been implemented when we did the survey, however, was axed six days after the survey was released. Um, so, you know, perhaps another uh, another indicator that investors are, are voting with their feet um, in these states where they feel that they are being penalised, um, God forbid, for owning one investment property so they don't have to rely on the pension in retirement. When it came to Capital City, and this is new data, um, it was actually Melbourne. Um, was the number one location, city location, where investors had sold in the previous 12 months, and Brisbane was number two. Yeah. Uh, number three was regional Queensland. So again, you know, we've got these bookends there of, you know, th this is where people are selling, and we've already spoken about in the show the reasons why they're selling. And then when you look at the fact that, you know, the number one place where people have sold is a capital city is, is Melbourne, number two is Brisbane, and then the number one reason why people are selling, number one and two reasons are increasing government taxes or threatening of increasing taxes um, and also changing tenancy legislation. Well, it's fairly simple to work out what's what's happening there. Absolutely. And I, I think what, what really reinforces that uh, in very stark terms is that, you know, nearly a, a quarter of investors are sold in Melbourne and, a, and, a, and nearly a, a quarter in Brisbane. But if you then look at the the other capital cities, mm. only uh, just, just under nine percent in Sydney, just under six percent in Adelaide, 
a bit over six percent in Perth and only th a bit over three percent in Canberra. Well, that that's really reinforcing uh, uh, your conclusions there around the the uh, restrictive measures and and potential uh, cost mm. increases that are being imposed by those those state governments. So some pretty clear messages there. And uh, sort of shifting to a more positive note now, Nicola. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> given the sort of uh, some of the the exercises coming out of there, which states are investors feeling most welcome? on the, the ranking basis that came out of the survey, do you know? Yeah, so this was a new question that we asked as well. And, um, you know, you can interpret the data a, a few different ways, um, which made the analysis a little a little tricky. Um, however, you know, uh, with, with our survey respondents, um, it was ranked from one being the most accommodating state to eight being the least accommodating. And if we're looking at the results, um, the highest percentage of uh, survey respondents that gave a location of one was actually for South, I think it was for South Australia, um, but from 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 this, um, uh, so we, you know, we it was a bit difficult to actually, you know, extrapolate the data, but uh, we certainly are starting to sort of see those, you know, those states where things haven't changed a lot. Probably also when we think about the least accommodating, the most accommodating. Clearly, this is a sentiment survey, um, but often it's a it's a reflection of perhaps if the market's been really good there over the time, you know, and certainly South Australia is is that way. Um, New South Wales obviously featured very well in this in these results too. Uh, ACT was fairly down the list though, uh, from memory of um, the, the one of the least accommodating um, states. Um, and I know this is supposed to be optimistic and positive, and it is. Um, but a lot of the results certainly reflect the fact that these, you know, the markets that are seen as the most accommodating are the markets that are probably performing quite well at the moment. There haven't been massive policy shifts. Um, investors clearly feel welcome there. Um, by far and away, the least accommodating state um, was Victoria, uh, with about, I think it was about 57% of respondents giving that an eight with eight being the least accommodating. Um, interestingly, uh, nearly a quarter of survey respondents uh, gave uh, uh, Queensland a seven. So, um, you know, yeah, so we could, you know, again, you know, it is a Queensland, and if we're talking about the tales of woe or, you know, the fact that investors are selling in great numbers in these states, um, every single metric that came out of the survey are, are pinpointing that at time and time again. And clearly also investors are saying, you know, we're selling in these places because we don't feel welcome. Absolutely. And I, I think the, the big message for state governments there mm. is, that, you know, the intentions are indications of future action. And uh, let's face it, the uh, land tax uh, exercise is a big part of state government budgets. So uh, th there's a big message there for, uh, you know, Victoria in particular and ACT uh, as well, and, and and to some degree Queensland, that they need to wake up to themselves because one thing that is really clear in the work that we do across the industry is that investors are much more borderless than they've ever been in the past due to the technology uh, increases and the ability to get much more information about areas beyond your local backyard. So I think there's a there's a pretty clear flow on message that's going to impact on those states if they don't wake up to those uh, trends that are, are clearly emerging. Um, and, and speaking about trends, uh, what are some of the challenges or concerns that, that came out of the survey that uh, investors are facing right now, Nicola? You know, what was interesting, well, in a way, it's kind of a little scary. Um, we really need to talk, uh, talk about more positive stuff, I suppose. But um, last year, we asked investors um, about their intentions to sell in the 12 months ahead. Um, and 19, about 19% 19 said that they were considering selling. As we talked about at the start of the show, 12% um, actually went, up, went ahead and, and did that. Okay, so out of the 19% last year who said they were thinking of selling, 12% did. Mm -hmm. um, this year, the survey showed that 38% of investors were thinking of selling um, in the year ahead, you know, and that's mind boggling. That's double, like on literally double of last year. And then if we're sort of saying, well, two thirds of the people that said they were going to sell last year did, if you look at two thirds, you're like, we're talking, that would be, uh, I, I would, I hate to think the impact of, of of that you know and again uh we asked we asked the investors um what are the reasons that you would be selling and it's the same reasons as they've already sold which is just you know the change the, the changing policy levers um the, the increases of taxes um you know in the last 12 months clearly we've had the new victorian land tax instigated 
um, which would um, make many investors have to pay land tax for the first time in, in their lives. And that might be the straw that breaks the camel's back or already has been. Um, and look, we do, we saw that last year with the with the Queensland interstate land tax. Yes, there was an industry campaign against it because it was appalling policy. Um, but, you, you know, um, the, 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 the consequences of that that policy could have been catastrophic. I mean, obviously things in Queensland are still pretty bad, um, but at least they saw the good sense um, to repeal that. Um, not a lot of, you know, legislation doesn't get repealed very often. Um, they don't like to admit that they might have made a mistake. Yeah. Um, but, you know, Queensland, at least, you know, to give credit where it's due, um, the government did listen to the industry, uh, did respect a variety of data sources that were coming out here in Queensland and acted in the best interests of the property of the rental market, which is investors and tenants. Can't, the one can't exist without the other. It's so, geez, you know, it would be nice. It would be nice to think that the Victorian government uh, might consider, some, you know, adapting or uh, rep I don't know. We clearly they're trying to fill the, the the bucket that was, you know, spent during COVID. But um, it would be really nice if they recognised the same as the Queensland government did last year, which is, is a punitive tax, a punitive additional cost when investors are already struggling with, you know, significantly higher uh, holding costs, um, passing on a very small percentage of those holding costs to investors, our survey, uh, to tenants, our survey found. Yeah. So, yeah, so unfortunately, um, as we sit here, uh, it's not looking good. If, you know, 38% of investors are thinking about selling still, um, well, I don't, good Lord knows what our conversation will be next time, this time next year, Bushy. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think some of the, the standout concerns that I, I picked up from the read of the survey myself were, you know, nearly 70% uh, concerned about uh, the, the threat of rental caps or freezes. Mm -hmm. uh, there was uh, the, the other number that sort of stuck out to me, just under 70% expressing concern about the growing negative public perception of the role that uh, investors are playing. Now, that, that that's a, a, a big concern, I think, moving forward. And uh, the other thing, too, uh, what stood out for me was that the nearly half of the respondents uh, indicating that if governments further increase or introduce new, t new taxes, they'll be forced to increase the rents. So, you know, you, you can't penalise one end without having a flow-on effect. So I, I think there needs to be a much more holistic view by governments uh, at all levels around this to see uh, and to look at the inconsequential uh, or unforeseen impacts that some mm -hmm. of these measures are having. So that's all good. Now, uh, uh, sort of still focusing on the trends uh, piece and the shifts in sentiment, uh, have there been any in, in relation to the the good old preference between city versus regional investment locations that came out of this year's survey? Yeah, definitely. And I will have to refer a little bit to my notes because, as I say, I don't even know how many stats we have in this report. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, we... Uh, over the years, you know, we always ask investors where they think, you know, have the best, um, you know, the best investment prospects for the year ahead. And we did start to see that shift um, to regional locations during during COVID um, physically uh, and, and investment dollars as well. But um, uh, the last year's survey found 56% of respondents felt that metro markets offered the biggest, uh, the best investment prospect prospects, which is really unusual. 56 yeah. is quite low, right? But that's obviously, an, you know, a reflection of the hangover from COVID and the regional migration. Uh, this year, though, a staggering 74%. Uh, said one of the capitals offered the most appealing prospects. So, you know, look, we are moving back into probably more long-term um, data that's that's reflective of what normally happens uh, because during COVID there was a lot of things that happened that don't, that don't normally happen and we're unlikely to see them again in our lifetimes or God willing unless there's something really bad that's happening. Uh, so we are starting to see investors sort of recognising um, that, you know, metro markets, uh, they're feeling that that's the best investment prospects. What was really interesting, though, and I'm not too sure if this is another question, I'll just throw it in here. Oh, you know, you've got, you've got it there. I'll just go to that um, in a sick wave of myself. That <laughs> was about the change in the locations where investors yes. were thinking were the best prospects. Yeah. Um, do you know what? I was doing some research on this the other day for a journalist. Um, I have a feeling, so we've been running the survey since 2015, um, I have a feeling it's the first time that Brisbane hasn't been number one. Mm, 
I think you're right. Because I was going back through all of the, every time we've asked this question since 2015. And Brisbane's always up the top, man. It's always up the top. Yeah. Um, probably affordability, uh, lifestyle. We have a lot of interstate migration. We actually probably have, uh, you know, a large percentage of interstate investors as well. So, but this year it was Perth. Mm. Um, and, and Brisbane was 20, was at uh, number one with Perth 25% and Brisbane at, at 21%. Um, twelve percent tipped uh, Adelaide. Yeah. What was what's really interesting though is that um, Brisbane was fifty eight percent in twenty twenty one. So fifty about, around about that in in twenty twenty one about fifty eight percent of respondents said that they thought Brisbane by far and away. It actually got from a from a media point of view. We were always kind of like, well, we always sound the same thing about the stat, you know. Um, so, so you can see how the mighty have fallen, right? Went from 58% and now it's 21.8. But also in this other research that I was doing, yeah. only 4% of respondents picked Melbourne as having this year, as having the best investment prospects. 4%. This is our second biggest capital city. And then I, when I was doing this research the other day, it's actually fallen I think that its peak was around about 27% in about 27 in our 27 uh, 20, 2017 survey the peak was about 27% and now it's 4%. I mean it's almost as bad as Darwin. Um so that was just mind boggling man that and again I mean Brisbane's still in favor because you know look and do we agree with that with that that sentiment right this is what people believe when I look back over the data over the last 9 years Hardly any investors had any sentiment for Hobart the whole time. And you know what? They really should have. Um, so this is about how investors are thinking and feeling about a place. Um, doesn't necessarily mean it, it marries up with what would be sound investment strategy. Because do we really believe that Melbourne doesn't have sound investment prospects? No. But because they, they don't feel that they're welcome there, they are. that is an indication that they're not going to bloody buy there. And they're borderless, like you've said. And a lot of people, as we already know, have been buying in Perth for a while now. You know, Brisbane is hard. You know, the state government, although well, Brisbane's still very popular. You know, well, it is, but it's half as popular as it used to be. Spot on, and 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 yeah. this is the an important message. I think is is the impact that sentiment is having on people's uh, actions and decisions now, and a lot of that is fed fed in through the mainstream media, obviously. Mm. Uh, but uh, to see such dramatic changes that you've, you've just illustrated there, it's pretty telling for, for state governments in, in relation to uh, the messages they're sending out there and the, and the likely flow-on effect that that's going to have. When we come back, Bushy asks Nicola about the impact an investor's sentiment has on the type of property he or she feels will give them the best result. New, established house or unit? After this short break, we'll find out what Nicola McDougall from Pippa believes. And that's based on the results of Pippa's investment sentiment survey released earlier this month. This is Realty Talk. Bushy back in just a moment. Property deductions can save you thousands of dollars each year. To make sure you maximise deductions, you need to work with the most experienced quantity surveyor in the country. BMT Tax Depreciation is the leading specialist in the industry. They've completed over 700,000 tax deduction schedules for residential investment and commercial properties Australia-wide. BMT guarantee to find double your fee in the first full financial year deductions. Call BMT on 1300 728 726 today for an obligation free quote. Can you give us a bit of a feel for what properties uh, investors uh, and what types of properties they, they're looking to to buy in the next year? Look, you know, every every survey we have we have similar type of metrics that that come out of it, and um, you know, about two thirds of, of the of survey respondents have indicated that they'd be looking at uh, buying a house. Um, so that continues to be, you know, the preferred investment dwelling. I guess look, are becoming increasingly difficult to be able to afford one of those things. Um, so you know, and we are starting to see investors, you know, in greater numbers. Uh, purchase, you know, attached dwellings, whether it's a townhouse or or an apartment, um, and thankfully, you know, it, it does. For some, and you know, some investors they really, you know, they like to buy established property. Some investors, you know, are smart investors. 
um, buy good new dwellings as well. Um, we don't have a preference. You know, whatever suits you was is what suits you. Um, but what I have noticed over recent years, which is good, um, is that developers seem to be responding. Um, you know, this whole investor stock stuff. I mean, yawn. Talk about, you know, um, so, and whilst there might be a very, very small percentage of investors who might be keen on, you know, something that's quite crap and cheap, the majority of investors, if they're smart and working with PIPA members, um, are wanting to invest in something that's going to have capital growth yeah. over the years. And um, and that can happen, you know, um, if, for any dwelling. Um, whether it's existing or it's new, um, as long as you've you know purchased one that you know is ticking all the boxes that it needs to tick for that for that location now and into the future. Um, so I, I have noticed that developers seem to be a little bit more responsive to that. And and what I really also am seeing is people choosing um, well, more for homeowners, I guess, but people choosing to live in apartments as a first choice and not as second choice. I've lived in apartments my whole ownership um yeah. i do have i do i don't just own apartments but i i, I live in them um uh it's small and it's a small block but um because i actually I, I don't like gardening i don't like doing the lawn uh but also i travel a lot and i you know have a busy life and i like to lock up and leave and so we are starting to see i think you know that um evolution of sentiment as well, sentiment in regards to where people want to live and why they want to live there instead of like just, oh, well, I need to buy a house. Well, if you can buy a house, that's great. But for many people, um, it won't be affordable either as their home or as an, an investment until many late, many years later when they've hopefully, you know, been in the market for a while. Yeah, I'll be very interested. There's been a lot of hullabaloo being made in the, the press about the whole uh, build to rent uh, mm. uh, that the institutional investors are starting to leap into. I, 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 I've sort of got mixed feelings around that in the in the context of whether it's actually going to assist the uh, the, the rental situation. Because my understanding is that those sorts of uh, developments are focused more at higher end. Uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what price point that they can offer them at because they're not doing it uh, for free. Uh, they need to make a profit. However, I, I did actually watch a really good show about this recently and it explained it uh, very well. And I suppose in a way, when we think about the fact that if a whole building is uh, leased to tenants and it's, um, and I think some modelling is that it's like that way for 10 years, right? Um, so tenants aren't going to have to move because the owner wants to renovate it because yeah. they want to sell it, which is their right, you know. So in that respect, that stability of supply will be created. I was I was the same as you, Bushy, but I did watch this show about it and I feel much um, uh, that I understand it a lot more. And even if we think about it like that, as long as it's good product, obviously, yeah. um, how affordable it's going to be, we don't know. But there will be that stability there for tenants that, that don't exist in the private market because that building will always be for renters for 10 years um, and they won't have to move because the owner rightly so wants to do something with their property because there's only the one owner. Uh, for that whole complex. So don't know if that complete segue or if that's helpful, but it was kind of like when I was watching the show, I had this little, oh, I kind of understood it a bit better now because it's very new here. It's not so new in, in other countries around the world. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. And, and thanks for, for sharing those thoughts. Well, sort of coming back to the, uh, you know, the sentiment in overall terms that's emerging from the survey, uh, if you were to sort of sum it up, what, what's it indicating generally, Nicola? Um, this year's survey showed about 55% of respondents believe now is a good time um, to invest in property. Um, you know, 55%, that sounds pretty good, right? Um, yeah. It is down slightly from last year and is down from 62% in, in 2021. So we are starting to see, you know, that declining sentiment among investors. Um Next year will be interesting to see where that is. I think it will jump up again. I think that is a reflection of market conditions at the time. Um, and clearly, we've, you know, in the last the 12 months to August, we had, you know, the record increases in, in interest rates in 18 months, but also fairly, fairly benign market conditions or falling market conditions in, in many places that only really started to uptick over recent months. So that's probably a reflection of the fact that all of our expenses have gone up and our prices have gone sideways. Um, that doesn't make you, you know, jump around, 
and with joy, does it? It just kind of goes, oh, well, and those of us who've been doing it a long time just kind of go, oh, well, we'll carry on. Um, so, yeah, so the sentiment there is much cooler than it was in 2021. But if we think about 2021, markets were booming, obviously, and 62% of survey respondents um, you know, said it was a good time to buy. You know, those of us who've been doing this a long time, uh, bushy, when when um, things are booming like that, I would suggest that it's not a good time to buy uh, because you should have bought the year before when things were not very good. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm a closet contrarian in that regard. Me uh, too. <laughs> no <laughs> doubt about it. Now, really good thoughts. Well, it's sort of bringing it all to a head then, sort of summarising mm. the whole exercise. What what are some of the key messages and implications that are emerging from the survey that our polis, policymakers, governments and, and the mainstream media need to be paying attention to, do you think? I mean, here we have, you know, a data set now that didn't exist before. Uh, so, and we've tracked it over the last three years and clearly it's showing that investors have, you know, offloaded their properties in, in record numbers. And not only that, um, they've actually been stripped from rental markets because it's been home buyers and homeowners that have that have bought them. Um, I think, as we said during the show, this is, you know, we believe one of the reasons why we have the current rental crisis. The rental crisis, though, it actually started, you know, the, the, the warning bells started in 2015 when APRA made those lending restrictions and, and investors weren't able to access finance. And, and we can certainly see uh, from ABS data the investor lending uh, just fall off a cliff, like free fall, free fall from 2015. And it kept on going, you know, and this is when we had, you know, before COVID, we still had really low interest rates. Um, but even with low interest rates, no one could get any money uh, or if you're an investor. Um, and that was in free fall until 2020. And it's only just started to sort of get back to those historical averages. So um, it's clear that investors, um, Look, and I don't think that investors should be selling if they can hold. Um, I always believe in a long-term mindset. Um, don't react to something that's happening in the short term. Politicians come and go. Poli you know, the threat of policies come and go. Um, the key is to hold for the long term um, and ride out the peaks and the troughs. Um, however, that's easier said than done. And for, for many investors who generally only own one property, that's not possible for them or they get spooked. You know, it doesn't take much to spook them. Um, and this is clearly what's been happening over the last 12 months with all of those policy changes as well as increasing the taxes. You know, I would like to be thinking about this over the last few days. It would be lovely to see uh, fewer punitive policies, um, you know, attacking investors who, let's be honest, su supply the vast majority of rental accommodation in this nation. I would like to see proactive policies that um, respect the vital role that investors play. And as you probably know, I was in Canberra last week and I was meeting with the um, the Shadow Housing Minister and had a, a really good chats, actually. Um, but, you know, when I sort of suggested to him, it would be really nice to, you know, have proactive policies um, that encouraged investors to come back into the market, but also motivated them to stay for the long term. And we had a bit of a chat off camera about that, what that might look like, we don't know yet. Um, but that's vital, right? Instead of these, you know, instead of these always these financial attacks on investors, how about actually going, wow, well, like while, while governments around this country have reduced their funding of social housing from 10% of housing supply to less than 2%, um, while they've been doing that and investors have been picking up the slack whilst at the same time getting taxes, increased taxes le levied on us left, right and centre. I'm sure I've said to you before, Bushy, I still cannot get my head around why investors pay more stamp duty. Stuff like that. Higher council rates. Everything. Why? What? Why? Higher interest rates. All of these things. Why is that? Why is that? So I would like that to change. It's obviously a utopian idea, but... It, we need to incentivize investors to get back into the market because they haven't been and and obviously a lot of them are leaving so how do we incentivize people to become investors and importantly how do we invest uh, incentivize them to stay for the long term and when i say long term i'm meaning decades so yeah. that we can create that stable supply of rental accommodation in this country because we don't have that at the moment beautifully said uh, and I, I really want to thank you for uh, this very revealing and, and very insightful run through the, the survey, Nicola. And it, as you just said, it further reinforces the need for our policies, policymakers and governments to actually reframe and reverse their thinking by stopping 
treating investors as the enemy and the problem by penalising and then hamstringing them to the detriment of the housing supply and rental affordability. And instead, as you, you well just said, to start embracing them as their best friends and actually the solution by uh, re-incentivising to continue invest as the only meaningful way that the rental crisis can be sustainably addressed. So I uh, just want to point to anyone listening to this, uh, if you want to learn more and to get the details of the survey, just jump on www.pipa, that's pipa.asn.au and check out the PIPA Annual Property Investor Sentiment Survey 2023. And Nicola, I just would really want to thank you again for sharing these very informative and very timely insights here on the show. Oh, thank you, Bushy. Thanks for the opportunity. Property depreciation is the natural wear and tear of a building and its assets. Property investors can claim depreciation as a tax deduction each financial year. Depreciation is a non-cash deduction. This means you don't need to spend any money in order to claim it. On average, BMT tax depreciation find residential investors almost $9,000 in first full financial year deductions. Call BMT on 1300 728 726 today for an obligation free quote. Subscribe now to Realty Talk. It's out every week. Well, that brings us to the end of this week's show. A big thanks to Nicola McDougall and the Pippa team, as well as Bushy, for helping us understand more about the outcome of the most comprehensive snapshot of the nation's property investment community. Make sure you don't miss a single episode of Realty Talk or Bushy's Get Invested podcast delivered to you each and every week. You'll do that by subscribing to the Property Hub now on your favourite podcast player or wherever you're listening to or watching this show. Thanks to our supporters and content partners, realty.com.au, BMT Tax Depreciation, Know How Property Finance, Get Rare Property and Apiro Marketing. I'm Kevin Turner, and on behalf of Bushy and the Property Hub team, we look forward to seeing you again next week.